This is part two of the presentation on the early Cold War. From 1945 until 1949, uh, the United States had an enormous advantage in the Cold War, and that is that the U.S. had a nuclear monopoly, uh, the only country with the atomic bomb. Uh, this changed, and that was an enormous shock uh, to the American people in 1949. Uh, the Soviet Union gained the atomic bomb, uh, and to make matters worse, spies in the United States had clearly played a role in it. Now, the, the Soviets would have gotten the atomic bomb sometime after this. It, wouldn't, it would have been a matter of uh, a, a few years, not many years, uh, but that didn't change the fact that uh, uh, the, there were spies who helped them get it, and this, of course, uh, played into the uh, Red Scare that would develop uh, later on. Uh, the United States, in response, tried to develop a hydrogen bomb, the super, they called it, uh, a bomb hundreds of times more powerful than the uh, fission bomb of the, uh, uh, the attacks on, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, so the, and, and this leads to a, an enormous arms race. The second shock of 1949 uh, happened in China, and that was the Chinese Revolution uh, that uh, made uh, the largest country in the world in terms of population a communist country. Uh, Mao Zedong was the leader, uh, and uh, on October 1st, 1949, he proclaimed uh, the People's Republic of China. The nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek fled to the small island of Taiwan off the coast of China, and that is the origin of the fact that uh, the mainland China and Taiwan are separate today. They have separate governments, uh, but they both claim to be the legitimate government of China. Um, and now that, uh, and and they they resist any suggestion that. Um, they're really separate countries, although in reality, that's what they are. Uh, so to the American people, it looked like we were losing the Cold War. The Soviets had gotten this awful weapon, and a quarter of the world's people had now, an additional quarter, had now come under uh, communist control. Uh, now, <clears throat> these two events uh, form the context for what would happen a few months later, and that is the Korean War. Uh, remember the doctrine of containment, that uh, the United States would not allow uh, communism to spread uh, where it already was. Well, uh, when uh, the Korean, when South Korea was invaded in 1950, uh, then containment uh, came into play in a major way and the United States was determined to hold the line against the future uh, expansion of communism. Now that brings us to the, the Korean War. Uh, at the end of World War II, remember the, uh, the Soviets uh, entered the war uh, in August, on August 8th, right near the end of it, uh, and they quickly uh, poured across the border into the Korean Peninsula. Uh, you see here that uh, the Soviets shared a, um, a small border with North Korea, uh, and uh, at the same time, American troops were in the south, uh, and the U.S. and the Soviets agreed uh, that, that, that there would be a line dividing the two along the 38th parallel. Um, the, the Japanese surrendered to the Soviets in North Korea and to the Americans in South Korea. Uh, so we have this uh, situation from 1945 until 1950 when uh, the uh, Soviets and the Americans were occupiers of uh, opposite halves of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, now by 1949, there were really two countries, uh, one communist in the north, one capitalist in the south. Now remember that it's, it's 1949 when China became a communist country. Uh, and they, of course, share a very long border with North Korea. Now, in June of 1950, the North Koreans invaded the South. 
Uh, it does not appear that this was orchestrated by the Soviets or the Chinese. Uh, this was uh, an effort uh, led by uh, Kim Il-sung, uh, the North Korean leader. Uh, he informed uh, the Soviets and the Chinese of what he was doing, uh, but uh, this was not something that they orchestrated. Later on, they did get involved. Uh, so the Chinese and the Soviets supported the North, but this was probably not uh, something that the, a decision that they made. However, they did support their communist allies in the North. Uh, now, if you look at how the map has changed, by late July 1950, uh, the uh, North Koreans had penetrated through most of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the Americans and the South Koreans were driven back to a little corner of South Korea uh, around Pusan, uh, and the situation was extremely desperate. Now, watch the map. Watch what happens here. Uh, General Douglas MacArthur, in what was certainly the most daring military maneuver of his career and arguably the most successful, uh, he launched a surprise amphibious invasion at Inshan, which is right up here. Um, amphibious, of course, means that you're uh, storming the beaches, a D-Day style invasion. Um, he, he caught the uh, North Koreans off guard. Uh, they began to try to backtrack to uh, stop uh, MacArthur's momentum. At the same time, the American and South Korean ground forces from Busan uh, broke out and began advancing northward, uh, and the entire momentum of the war had changed. Uh, by early November 1950, uh, the United States and South Koreans had invaded most of North Korea. Now, this involved a definite policy change, because remember that uh, the policy of containment said we weren't going to try to roll back areas where communism already existed. We were simply going to hold the line. Now, Truman made a uh, fateful decision that he would uh, take advantage of this opportunity and try to uh, unite Korea, North and South, uh, under uh, a democratic and, or at least a, a non-communist uh, regime, government. Uh, MacArthur uh, predicted to Truman that the Chinese would not enter the war, uh, and Truman consented to the invasion of North Korea. MacArthur, ho MacArthur however, uh, turned out to be wrong about that. Uh, in late... November of 1950 and January of up to January of 51, the Chinese sent between three and four hundred thousand troops into Korea. They turned the tide of invasion uh, and uh, you know invaded and, and penetrated the South again, uh, captured Seoul, the capital of the South. Uh, Douglas MacArthur at this point threatened, publicly threatened China with nuclear weapons, with the atomic bomb. Um, he did this without the approval of the President of the United States. This was an outrageous um, uh, violation of the normal role of a general. The general's role is to carry out the policy of the President. Uh, and he engaged in his own uh, statements, his own diplomacy, or his own threats uh, to try to uh, neutralize the Chinese, to scare them out of the war. Uh, this was uh, far beyond his uh, authority, and the result was that Truman fired him. The initial response in the United States was outrage toward Truman and enormous defense of MacArthur, but that gradually began to diminish uh, when uh, there were hearings held uh, that began to uh, show MacArthur's recklessness. Um, and, uh, and in fact, uh, when General Omar Bradley, who was highly respected, called it uh, the, uh, the wrong war uh, in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong enemy, meaning China, uh, the public opinion started to turn uh, against General MacArthur. 
the last uh, two thirds of the war were really a stalemate. Uh, really not that unlike World War One style trench warfare. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the sides became entrenched. Neither could break through. And what's really instructive here is that uh, there's a very great difference between the geography of Korea and the ge geography of Vietnam. Uh, had there been water on both sides of, of uh, uh, Vietnam, th th that war might have turned out very differently. Uh, you notice here you have jungle. And through the Ho Chi Minh Trail, uh, the North Vietnamese were able to infiltrate South, South Vietnam uh, and create an incredibly difficult situation for the Americans. In Korea, this was not a guerrilla war like Vietnam. This was a conventional war. Um, and the U.S. was well prepared to fight a conventional war, uh, and the North Koreans could not break through. Uh, so this stalemate went on for uh, essentially two years uh, until there were two new leaders in place. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower was inaugurated president in January of 1953, and just two months later, uh, Joseph Stalin died. Uh, and uh, with Truman and Stalin uh, out of the picture, uh, the two sides were able to reach a truce, not a peace treaty. We still don't have that uh, all these, these years later, but we do, they, they did have a truce uh, as of June of 1953. Uh, there was a demilitarized zone set up, and that uh, demilitarized zone is still there today and at times is still tense. Uh, the United States uh, still has uh, some troops in North Korea. Uh, I'm going to move on to a few major events of the later 1950s. Uh, the United States was shocked in 1957 when the first satellite uh, was launched into outer space and it was by the Soviets. It was called Sputnik. Uh, in itself, it didn't do anything. It was a little uh, like basketball-sized uh, ball that simply revolved around the Earth and, and sent out beeps. That's all it was. Uh, but it was a shock because of the potential that existed in the future that the space that space could be used uh, as a military platform. There was some loss of faith in Dwight Eisenhower's leadership. Uh, and this, uh, more than anything else, launched the space race. It also gave a tremendous boost to the teaching of math and science and engineering in American schools. Uh, the idea was that we were somehow behind the Soviets uh, and that we needed to catch up. Uh, so this was an enormous wake-up call to the United States. Uh, the Soviets continued to do well uh, in the competition uh, by launching the first uh, ICBM, Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, uh, a missile that could uh, travel long distances and uh, potentially deliver atomic weapons. Uh, in 1957, uh, the, the, the missile that launched Sputnik uh, was created, and this carried the, the potential uh, of carrying weapons uh, to the other side of the world. Uh, the U.S. was not able to develop uh, missile technology uh, enough to break the bonds of gravity and make it into outer space successfully until the Atlas missile in uh, 1959. An earlier uh, American attempt to send a missile up resulted in, in a crash and explosion uh, some Americans, uh, uh, journalists, uh, compared uh, Sputnik to what they called Flopnik, uh, the early U.S. missile. Uh, in 1959, though, both sides had ICBMs, uh, and this uh, raised the level of danger in the Cold War to a whole uh, other plane. Um, when missiles entered the Cold War, the reaction of doves and hawks was predictably opposite. Uh, the doves said, peace is best achieved by disarmament. We have to get rid of these weapons as much as possible and reduce tensions. Uh, the hawks said, 
No, the, the best way to achieve peace is to is through strength and deterrence. Uh, if we're strong, they won't dare attack us. Um, and deterrence means to convince somebody that it would be very unwise to do something, to deter them, to stop them from doing something. Now, uh, out of the basically, the United States adopted uh, the policy of the Hawks, uh, and it came to be called MAD, which stood for Mutual Assured Destruction. Uh, they won't attack us because they know that if they do, we will destroy them. And we won't attack them because we know that if we do, they will destroy us. Now, this led to an enormous arms race because the fear of both sides was that the other side could gain a first strike capability. What that meant is they could hit the other side with so much force that they could destroy the nuclear arsenals. They could destroy the weapons on the ground uh, and therefore because it was possible to win a nuclear exchange, they might be tempted to try it uh, because they could completely eliminate the other side. And of course, if this were the case, that would eliminate deterrence. Uh, you don't deter somebody unless you have the ability for a second strike to hit back, in other words. Uh, and this uh, gave an enormous boost to the arms race. Now, in attempting to make sure that neither side, that the other side didn't have a first strike capability, both sides engaged in different uh, delivery systems for nuclear weapons. Uh, we had what was called the nuclear triad, land, air, and sea. Uh, land meant uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles in hardened silos in the ground in places like North Dakota, lots of them so that they couldn't all be destroyed by uh, a Soviet strike. In air, that meant B-52 bombers. Uh, at times, uh, they were in the air around the clock carrying nuclear weapons, uh, which would make it that much more difficult to, to stop uh, an American strike. And the third uh, was C. That meant uh, submarines carrying nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, as these weapons developed, uh, one American nuclear submarine, which, which was not only powered by nuclear energy, but carried nuclear weapons, uh, had, was carried ab aboard uh, this submarine more destructive power than had been used by all sides in all of World War II. That was the level of escalation that weaponry had achieved uh, by this point in the Cold War right around 1960 uh, with the election of John F. Kennedy. And Kennedy uh, actually campaigned uh, on the, the argument that there was a missile gap, that the Soviets had uh, more missiles, more powerful missiles, uh, a stronger force than the United States. And he criticized Eisenhower on this. That turned out not to be true, not even close, uh, but that was a, a major issue in both parties Kennedy, of course, was a Democrat, and both parties uh, stood for a very uh, strong, aggressive uh, policy in the Cold War. In another presentation, we'll come back to events that take place later on uh, in the 1960s and beyond.